Right now is the 30th anniversary of the Apple Macintosh. And we're very lucky. We've actually got the real thing. So I'd like to take you through some of the features of it and uh, make you gasp with amazement at how much it costs, how it works, and to marvel at the fact that although it will seem very basic when I show it to you, this was absolutely groundbreaking. It's a completely new computing paradigm. I've actually upgraded this thing over the years. It's got a hard disk underneath, but I won't turn the hard disk on for the moment. Let me just give you the experience of what it was like with the original Mac, which is what this was, although it has been upgraded. Just switch it on and wait. And pretty soon you'll be amazed. It's not colour, but it has. For 1984, when this came out, got the most amazing thing of a totally bitmapped screen. So, it's blinking a question mark, and that is telling you that it expects to boot, by default, from a floppy disk. You put in the Mac operating system on a floppy disk, you boot it up, you wait patiently while it's got the operating system software inside it, then you've uh, got to decide which particular application you want to use, so that probably involves digging out yet more floppy disks with MacWrite or Microsoft Word or something on them. That is what it was like. And just to hammer home the point, here we have Adobe Acrobat version 1. So even at this date, which was in 1993, I think, when this came out, this was the way you got your distributions for a Macintosh. We're a little bit upset with this that we can load the Acrobat software, but unfortunately we don't have a key to unlock it and make it start. We're desperately trying to get one from Adobe, because that's quite an heirloom, that is. So you can imagine the pain of having to run everything on floppy disks, and the big day came fairly soon in Mac Evolution, when you could buy an optional extra hard disk. This one, the Rodin one here, is 20 megabytes. Let's switch it on. Back in the early days of the computer science group, which was just becoming the Department of Computer Science, 1984-1985 time, we did buy the, about a half dozen of these. We couldn't afford more. They were expensive. But by the late 80s, early 90s, despite the upgrades, they were becoming a little long in the tooth, a bit slow. By that time, we were equipped with Unix workstations. I decided that we would sell them off, and my daughter bought one. And even in 1993, she took this to Cambridge with her to do all her essays in her English degree, which she did. And even when she did a law conversion course afterwards, going right through to 1997, it still served her very well indeed. So it's become a kind of family heirloom. Uh, I put it away in a cupboard at home, almost forgot all about it. But now, what better timing than to have a fully working Mac? I don't know if you noticed that the thing when it first booted up it came up with a smiley face. And for people who hated computers, this was wonderful. It clearly loves me. I'm not scared of computers anymore. It's so friendly. What you're seeing here is a little bit of the kind of technology that was developed at this legendary Xerox Park place. It's very scaled down. It had to meet a, a a killing price point. So, for example, you don't get the Xerox Alta three-button mouse, you get a one-button mouse. You get the nine-inch screen, a small keyboard, floppy disk reader. Steve Jobs was not a person that liked hobbyist computing. He really wanted a smooth thing like this, preferably as impenetrable as possible. He never really liked the idea of upgrading things or letting mere amateurs in to his beautiful creation. So the story went out, it was going to be $600, and not just sold in Radio Shack, but sold in Kmart. So that it would become a cool accessory for your home, or even, shock horror, a business computer. Well, they didn't make the 600 They didn't make the $600 by a factor of three. When it first came out, it was $1,800. And looking back in the archives now, I find that that was for the utterly minimal configuration with 128 kilobytes. Now, the engineers, again, according to the stories I've read, unbeknownst to Jobs, fitted a backplane in there that was capable of taking half a megabyte. But they didn't tell Jobs because he made, made them take it out, because it's going to add to the cost and it will encourage people getting into the back of the machine and daring to tamper with it and upgrade it. But of course, when upgrades became so necessary, it was probably Jobs' idea all along. Now remember, 
we're back in the era of command line computers. We're back in the era of MS-DOS. We're back in the era, for those of us brought up on units, where you're quite happy just typing in on a command line and things happen. But here is a completely new way of doing computing. You point at things, you click, you drag, you size and so on. So this is so familiar to you now because we're all used to Windows-based systems. Wow, these things are called folders. They hadn't existed before. And when you look at it, you think, it's spidery writing and, and, and it's all black and white and this changed the world. Oh yes, it did. Looking under applications, listen to the disk click. Wow, Mac Draw. I think that's probably a pretty good one, actually. Just to show you something of what was so revolutionary about this and which you certainly could not do on one of those dumb terminals that were character based. Let's draw ourselves a rectangle with actions that we're now so familiar to. I put the cursor where I want the top left hand corner to be and I drag out a rectangle. And there it comes with all its points on it where you can drag it to become wider or shallower or move the whole thing bodily and so on. Select text. Hello. What more could you wish for? The graphics design and graphic arts community just loved it. They'd never been able to do this thing, sort of thing before. Certainly not on something as relatively affordable. We won't save the changes. Generally, even a, even a little pop-up like that saying, do you want to save this? Was oh, like, yes. yes. What, what sort of protection would it be for losing your work before? <laughs> what, you mean for, for doing the wrong click? Yeah, if you were... Well, not an awful a... lot, but, yeah. you know, yeah. Sean and I thought it would be a good idea just to show you a simple game. Because yes, it came with games. Here's one that my daughter and I used to play a lot. It's very simple, but we, we loved it dearly. It's called Mombasa. As you have already seen, it is, in a word, slow. It's a tile matching game. The aim of the game is to drill down through all of the piles that you see here, matching them as you go along, and eventually to end up with um, absolutely nothing at all. It was wonderful just to be able to play games with graphics, proper graphics on the screen. The Macintosh was a success in a way in 1984, but not quite in the total way that Steve Jobs wanted. As I think I've already explained, the graphics arts community loved it. Even education in high schools liked it. Computer science departments in universities liked it. The big problem was you could not afford in those days at $1,800, $2,000 a throw to start equipping a 100 seat terminal room with these things. You had a few of them to show the nature of the concept and that was a big, big problem for quite some time. Now, of course, since it had to be $1,800 and not the $600 that uh, was planned, Steve Jobs, with what his colleagues always correctly called his reality distortion field, made the following proposition. Hey, if it's $1,800, like, that's expensive. So therefore, it must be a business machine. It didn't really convince the business community. And of course, in many ways, the real winner from all of this a few years later was Bill Gates, because what this did do was throw down the gauntlet to Bill Gates to say, you've got to have to match this and exceed it because this is the way it will go in the future. So we're left with the thing that used to enrage Steve Jobs. It's wonderful, Steve, it's cute, but it's a bit of a toy. What is it for? There was an answer to that, and it came with the advent of a piece of kit that Steve Jobs had helped to bankroll. The Apple Laser Writer was a laser printer, as we would call them nowadays. It had got this wonderful new typesetting language inside it, and if that could be teamed up with the Macintosh, maybe this really would change everything. Well, did it? Hmm. That's another story. Gates just told them to think again. And he said to them very memorably, because he didn't like mentioning the word, he said, it's got to be like it is on the Macintosh. That's a really good question. And uh, personally, I've almost lost count. <laughs> it's, it's, it's certainly a couple dozen.